the only thing stronger than fear for self for us was fear of letting your platoon mate down or fear of getting your friends killed that to me is the greatest fear of all and I agree with you when if you accept that you may that you may die you may not come home your friends may not come home it's not being complacent about it it's not being okay well it's out of my hands I'm not no you're gonna do your best you will not get complacent you will remain hard to kill you will be effective in your job but you understand the risks of the work you have ahead of you and you you accept those risks so you are free to be effective in your job so i would say that everybody I would say that we all kind of knew that the day would come. And like you said, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't fatalistic. It wasn't um, complacency. It was r- the realistic assessment of where we were at. And I think everybody knew that the day would come. And maybe if someone says they didn't, it was only because they were, you know, able to convince themselves that to, you know, to keep a positive attitude. And the day did come. And we'd had a couple guys get wounded. Um, a couple, you know, Cowie was wounded bad. A lot of close calls. Innumerable, countless close calls. Which, in a way, kind of make you feel like maybe we can pull this off. But in the end, it's, it's, um, it's war. So, what did that do to you? August 2nd, 2006. hard to articulate in words what that day did. I talked a little bit in the beginning of how my father has shaped my actions to become a SEAL. Well, I'd say the events that unfolded on August 2nd, 2006 and days afterwards where we lost much better warriors than I, much braver and selfless. That those were much more formative in shaping what I do and will do for the rest of my life. You know, we lost the actions of that day. We lost two really good men. Um, I don't even know where to start. You know, One of my good friends, one of our good friends, Ryan Job, was hit in the face. God, I learned a lot that day. I think we all—I think we all did. And um, a piece of us stayed there that day, died with us. You know, Ryan was was hit in the face. and I remember going single cracks are usually not good. The crack, you know, in the crack, when I say crack, I mean, um, 
when you are on the giving end of a rifle, you it's a much different sound than being on the receiving end of a rifle that of a bullet that's supersonic. It makes a very distinctive crack. And when you hear that, and it's a single one, it generally is not good. And I remember that radio call coming out from Leif saying that Ryan had been hit and that I was needed. Um, and I remember going on the roof and seeing Ryan lying down in a pool of his blood. And uh, uh, there's these images in my head that just have so much human compassion in a crazy chaotic time. And I remember Leif uh, and Chris at his side and Leif was holding his hat, holding his hand and just saying, just hang on brother, we just hang on man. And uh, I did the best I could to stabilize Ryan, but Ryan's, Ryan's a trooper. I mean, he's, he was the best of us. Um, even then, not concerned about his own welfare, making sure that we were safe, we, we were being safe, we were being safe and staying low. Um, and we had Mark was there, laying down some good covering fire to get Ryan out of that position. And I, uh, um, we called on our brothers from the army um, um, to bring us the armor we needed to get out of there. And I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so I accompanied Ryan out of there. And there's not much you can do as a medic in that type of situation. I'm not keeping Ryan alive. I'm keeping his airway open, stopping the bleeding, and that's it. He's keeping himself alive. And the definitive care he needed was a surgeon. He needed to get to an operating table stat. And we talk about things to learn from that day, failures. I had one of my biggest failures from that day. And it pains me to this day because Ryan didn't see it that way. We stopped off at one of the aid stations, I think at Cop Falcon along the way, which just to paint this room, it was a concrete 20 feet by 20 feet room with no electricity, no running water, definitely not a place to get definitive care. And uh, it was being manned by an 04 army physician's assistant. Um, who I think had the best of intentions, but had other clouding human emotions that resulted in poor judgment. One being ego, which is perhaps the biggest poison of all in anything we do. And just to give you an idea of this, I mean, it was a war zone down there. I mean, just a few days prior to that, we had been mortared in that area and a few army soldiers were hit by this mortar bad. And uh, we were pretty close in our in Cop Falcon. And uh, I went over to try and help. And some of these guys were pretty hypovolemic, which is a word for saying they were low on blood volume because they were losing it. And I was trying to get IV access on one of these guys, and I had a hard time doing it. Um, eventually was able to get a jug, a stick in, in the neck. But this, uh, the guy who was manning it, the so far, um, was, you know, just giving me a hard time about it, which it's fine. I think we give each other a hard time. We make fun of each other. But I think, I've, I mean, I took it hard myself because I was like, man, I really wanted to help these guys. And I was failing and giving, getting this line in, getting an IV line in. Um, and I was naive and just, just, I think, insecure. I was professionally embarrassed that I could not get this line in. And so and I was a little t intimidated by this guy. Um, so I had that painting of this situation with this relationship with this person. And coming in, I knew that coming into this aid station at Cop Falcon was only going to hurt Ryan. And I was yelling at the Army guys. I mean, E1, E2 you know, E drivers who were just doing what they were told. I'm like, we need to go to Camp Ramadi right now. 
to get to an OR. And they were telling me we need to stop off this aid. We have orders to stop off at this aid station. And Ryan's on this cot. And I mean, there's no way to get definitive care. You can't even be sterile in this area. I mean, it's just a concrete room with no electricity. And he was trying to give a nasopharyn- an MPA, a nasopharyngeal airway to Ryan, which is a little, remember the trumpet mm-hmm. nose you put in, the, yep. keeps an airway secure. But you never, ever give an MPA to folks listening to this who have any kind of medical background. You would never give an MPA to someone with suspected facial, with suspected maxillary fractures, which is what Ryan certainly had after being shot through the left cheek, right, around around the left orbit. And I was, top of my lungs, arguing with this guy that this is not what he needed, like, you should not do that. We needed to get to Camp Ramadi. And there was a certain power differential, right? I mean, I was E5, 21, 22 year old kid, and I had this O4 who was telling me how things should be done. And Ryan's there um, hearing all of this. And I, like a lot of army regulations. I mean, I'm not trying to give any disrespect to the army, but the the two drivers who drove me there were like, you need to clear and safe your weapon. And, you know, if, if you remember, there's always a barrel outside of every building. You have to clear and safe it. And I understand because there's a lot of accidental discharges that happen in the military. But for team guys, I think that's like, like clearing your, like having to point your weapon in a barrel to clear and safe it is, not really, you don't need to do that. We can just clear and safe in a safe direction, right? Just be responsible, have um, accountability for muscle awareness and what you're doing. So I was like, and I was trying to fight this fight with this, with this PA. And then um, the other army soldiers were trying to like, you need to clear, you need to go outside right now and clear this weapon. So frustrated, I left, cleared my weapon, I came back and the PA had inserted the MPA into Ryan. And Ryan was coughing up blood and, and bad and I saw the look on this PA's face that he I think he recognized that this was outside his scope of abilities and that he was in over his head and may have hurt Ryan and from there my request to get to Camp Ramadi was immediately um, fulfilled and we got back in and loaded Ryan and, and got Ryan to Camp Ramadi to the appropriate level of care to awaiting surgeons and doctors to take care of Ryan. But to me, that's one of my biggest failures because I let Ryan down. And what pains me is that in the years afterwards, he always thanked me that I stood up for him. And uh, Ryan, I, I don't know why you're thanking me. I failed you. I could have done something more. I could have I could have stood up for my friend a little bit more. I could have, um, I don't know what I could have done, but I could have done something. He, Ryan deserved better. And who knows what this did. I mean, Ryan was blind, as you know, afterwards, but he says I was the last person he saw. He wishes I was a little prettier. Ryan likely became blind, secondary to infection, swelling, trauma. Um, But maybe that was the final straw that made him blind and eventually led to him getting all those surgeries, which eventually took his life. As you know, he he had multiple surgeries and one of his surgeries, um, he was unfortunately taken from us. I don't know, but I made a promise after that, that regardless of my rank of where I stood or of what kind of power differential I was, if I saw something wrong like that and I knew someone would get hurt, that I would stand up and speak and not let something like that ever happen again. We see 
things happen all the time that we know aren't right. You know, a lot of you sometimes you just know deep down that that's not right. And you choose your battles. I think it's important to choose what battles you stand up for. But there are some battles that you should never, ever stand down from. And I swore I would never make that mistake again. And I find it very relevant today. I mean, we accept the risks of our occupation for the greater good of what it does for society, our country, our species. And it's relevant in space exploration in NASA at what I've been honored and privileged to take it part of. And we accept the risks of what we are trying to do for the general good of what it brings back to humanity. But I think having that experience to know it's worth cashing in that currency, that reputation you've built up to speak up when something is up, when something's messed up. It's one of the, I feel like we could talk about that day for the rest of the, I think we could talk about August 2nd for the rest of the day, about all the other things. And that's just the first chapter of what happened that day. As you know, we lost Mark Lee on that day. Those, a lot of what I do today, I made a promise to not just those two, not to just to Mark and Ryan, but I can I can list a long list of names of people we've lost since then. That we, that the void created by those warriors that would certainly have done good for this world that I owe it, that we owe it to them to be a positive mark in this world. And that can take many forms. For me, that was why I wanted to be a physician. It didn't really matter that it was medicine and it was just natural for me because that's what I was involved in to take that level of service to a higher calling. But taking like Trying to become an astronaut is completely consistent with my promise to leave a positive impact in this world. And that's how I honor the brothers we lost. And I will never stop until the day I die trying to fill in that void because it's a void that can never be filled in. I was um, walking out of the tactical operations center on our little base on that day. And I remember I, I, I walked out and um, I looked over to my right, I walked out the door and I looked over to my right, um, and I saw you. And you were on your knees. You were fairly covered in blood. And you were uh, washing the blood. Washing the blood out of Ryan's helmet. And And I realized um, that this was going to take a very personal toll on everybody. 
and and I didn't know what to say. Um, there was no training. No one had been killed in Iraq before um, for SEALs. We never talked about, we never talked about, we talked about, hey, if a guy gets wounded, if a guy gets killed, here's what we're going to do in the next six minutes. Here's how we're going to get a guy extracted. Here's the casualty evacuation. Here's the protocol that we're going to go through. Here's the medical procedures we're going to do to try and save his life. These are all the things we're going to do in the 15 minutes from when someone gets hurt. And I had been in the SEAL teams for 16 years at that point, 15 years. And not one time ever in any training scenario did we ever talk about, okay, now what do we do? Now, there's a little protocol around, hey, here's the casualty um, the casualty officer that's going to go. Here's the protocol that we follow for notification of the family. All that stuff, all the mechanics of it existed. And we, we did what we were supposed to do. We followed that protocol. But the protocol for how do I look at a 21-year-old kid that's cleaning the blood out of one of his friend's helmets... There's no protocol for that. And what, I mean, what I had to do was because I was still the guy in charge. Um, and I had to try and figure out what to do. There was no one to ask. No one to ask. There's, there's, no, there's no person to say, hey, what do, you, what do I do now? And you know what what I defaulted to, which I actually told you guys in the clear three days later, two days later when I finally could uh, assemble a sentence was go back to work. Was that this is what we came to do. We still have a mission, we still have soldiers and Marines that are out there risking their lives that we absolutely provide safety and security for. We can deliver those guys home to their families. And that's that's what we need to do. And that's, you know, that's what we did. You know, sometimes words, there are no right words for situations like that. But I think just being there with the people you love at your side is the most important thing to be doing, to go back out and work and do the job you came there to do, that you signed up to do. And it's not for, I don't mean to be, disrespectful with with these words, but it's not for country or service. It's for the person sitting next to you, for standing next to you, for your brother and your sister. You do it because you love that person. Because at least to me and in my experience, the folks who joined to be SEALs who did it because they wanted to ser- serve their country, that was the greatest reason they were there. There wasn't a, a bigger intrinsic reason, like doing it for the person next to you, for the brotherhood, for yourself. They didn't seem to make it through. And I'm not sure if I would die 
for my country, but I would and I will die for my brother and sister, without a doubt. And that's just a taste of war. We lost two people that day. There are platoons, companies who have lost half, most of their unit. You think of, you see the numbers from World War II or from Vietnam. It's astounding. We, I'm, and I am not trying to belittle the sacrifices our service members have done in this war. But I'm just trying to put it in context that we had a whole generation of people, we asked them to continue fighting despite the heavy losses and casualties they suffered on a daily basis that trumped any number we had in the post 9-11 wars. And they did it. So, being there with your brothers and sisters and continuing that fight, that is the best remedy for a situation like that. And um, obviously the, the, the other, you know, I mean, it's, Real obvious, I guess, when you look back. But again, this is something that um, a lot of times we weren't prepared for in the modern SEAL teams. You know, when I when I was raising the SEAL teams in the '90s, we were preparing for one mission. If we were lucky, we'd do one mission, and that mindset kind of got into our heads, where you're you know you just didn't think about how how you would continue on. And yet, I mean, we stood down for like two days and then it was like, okay, get your gear back on and it's time to go. Even in that same day after Ryan was hit, we said, get your stuff on, get your gear back on, reload, get back out there. And I mean, it, it, it pains me to this day that I wasn't there for that assault because I was with Ryan. And I'm glad that I was by Ryan's side. But I meant I wasn't there for Mark when he was shot and killed. The next time I saw him was in the morgue giving hit giving a final kiss to his forehead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, yeah, you're you're exactly right. And and so Ryan wounded and I mean severely wounded. Um And then yeah, you're right. It wasn't even a day. It was a matter of an hour maybe before Leif called me up and said, hey, this is what's going on. And then, yeah, once Mark was gone, then it was a couple days and then, okay. And again, the, 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 the strange thing or I guess the thing to contemplate a little bit deeper is you know, if you're going on to Guadalcanal, like you're going to fight and you're not going to have time to think about what just happened. Whereas, hey, the way it was for us, it was like, okay, well, now you're going to stand down for two days. You're going to think about everything. You're going you're gonna to package up your, your bro's gear and send it home. That's what's going to happen. You're going you're gonna to be thinking about that. And then... You're going to get in the same vehicles. You're going to roll out. And I 
And that's what, as you said, that's what you do for your brothers. That's what you do. You keep doing your job. You know, I was, I was thinking about that too when you were talking about shooting. And you were talking about, look, you, you know what you do? You know how you get through that part of the course? You follow the procedures. You do your job. You check your body position. You front sight focus. How do you complete the stocks? You, you, fig, you figure out where the dead space is. You follow the protocol. That's what you do. That's, that's what you do. That's how you move forward. You do what you're supposed to do. And of course, it wasn't over either, um, because because then you know, in September, we lost Mikey as well. So close to being home, going home, and. A million different excuses that you could make to not go out and do your job. 